In the second part of the climate change lecture, uh, B, we're going to talk about some of the causes of climate change and move into some of the effects and what we can do about it as natural resource managers. This is an overview of the carbon balance of the earth. And there's two main things shown here. One is the pools of carbon. So these are in pedograms of carbon. A pedogram is a very large number. I mean, basically, it's, it's almost an unimaginably large number, but a pet, one pedogram uh, is one billion metric tons. Uh, so, you know, the, these pools um, are in the trillions of metric tons. It's, these are some very large numbers, um, but uh, this allows you to get relative sizes of pools. So this is where carbon is located uh, in the oceans. There's a lot of carbon in the oceans. There's a lot in coal, oil, and fossil fuel deposits, fair amount in plants and soil, and some in the atmosphere. Now, so that's the pools the arrows indicate flows okay these are the flows of carbon from the atmosphere to plants and soils and in the other direction same thing with ocean thing same thing with fossil fuels so a couple of things to note here first um, the interaction between the atmosphere and oceans and the interaction between the atmosphere and plants and soils are almost in balance Okay, there's a little bit more um, carbon being put into the atmosphere from plants and soil than is being taken up, taken up by photosynthesis, obviously, released due to respiration, but then also deforestation. So because we're clearing some land and not putting it back in forest, that makes this number a little bit bigger. And that does contribute to more CO2 in the atmosphere. Oceans, those two arrows are approximately balanced, a little bit more being taken up than is being put out. This one right here is the one that's causing problems. Um, there didn't used to be an arrow between fossil fuels and the atmosphere, but once uh, we started burning fossil fuels uh, for energy during the Industrial Revolution, we started taking carbon out of that pool and putting it up into the atmosphere. Um, and that's happening to the tune of 6.5 petagrams per year. Um, this is what's causing our global change issues is um, burning fossil fuels for energy. So uh, there are many locations that are measure, measuring CO2 concentration of the atmosphere, um, but this is the most famous one. This is, uh, is actually an um, observatory on Mauna Loa, a mountain in Hawaii, but they happen to have some instruments for measuring CO2 concentration at that observation site. And the reason this is a useful location is because it's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean up on a mountain. So basically those sensors are up in the atmosphere that's really well mixed. So measurements of CO2 concentration in this location are a pretty representative um, place to measure CO2 concentration for the atmosphere as a whole. And this is the time series of CO2 concentration uh, measured at Mauna Loa from the late 50s, where they started, until um, just about the time I prepared for this lecture in July of 2023. So there's a couple of things to note here. The first is that um, this red line, these are, um, I believe these are monthly values. It goes up and down on a, on a small scale. And what those are, these are the peaks are the Northern Hemisphere winter, 
and the low parts are the northern hemisphere summer. And those variations are caused by variations in the amount of CO2 taken up by plant photosynthesis. It's focused on the northern hemisphere because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere and therefore more plants. So in the summer, northern hemisphere is in its growing season. There's lots of photosynthesis going on and that draws down the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere a little bit. In the winter, when more plants are dormant in the northern hemisphere, there's more CO2 or less CO2 taken out of the atmosphere. So the atmospheric CO2 concentration goes up a little bit. So this pattern would exist in the absence of fossil fuel emissions, but it would look like this. It would go up and down, but it would be flat from year to year, okay? So the average would just look like this. But that's the big thing we're looking at here is this smooth average here that's going up. Every year, the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere goes up, and that seasonal pattern is overlaying on that. So right now, you know, our average CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is about 420 parts per million. Uh, back when I was in graduate school and measuring CO2 concentration with some of my photosynthesis instruments, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was around 350, okay? So that tells you about, you know, when I was in graduate school, it was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, that's going up mainly because of fossil fuel emissions. So why is this a problem? It's a problem because of the greenhouse effect. Now the greenhouse effect is not a problem. The greenhouse effect is caused because CO2 molecules absorbs infrared radiation. Okay, so when energy of the sun warms up the earth, the earth emits some of that heat back upwards as infrared radiation. Okay, and then CO2 molecules in the atmosphere catch some of that infrared radiation and radiate it back to the Earth. Okay, so the Earth is radiating infrared up. Some of that's being caught by CO2 molecules and that's radiating it back down. This causes Earth to be warmed. And at some level, this is good. Without the greenhouse effect, uh, we'd be at zero. We'd be a block of ice, okay? Fortunately, the greenhouse effect uh, keeps us from being a block of ice and makes temperatures moderate enough that life uh, as we know it can exist on Earth. The problem is that because we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere, more of that infrared radiation that used to escape out into space is being absorbed by those CO2 molecules and sent back to the Earth. And that's causing our temperature to gradually rise. So when we look at records of temperature, this is from about 0 AD to, this is to 2004, but the pattern is continuing. This shows patterns of temperature um, since year zero. <coughs> and what you can see is that there was a, a lot of variation in temperature uh, during that period of time and, e and even some uh, pretty cool temperatures um, during the medieval period that was actually called the Little Ice Age. So it got pretty cool then. But around uh, the middle, of the 19th century, temperatures 
pretty dramatically started to rise. So around this period of time, temperatures started to rise drastically. Um, that's about the time of the Industrial Revolution. And we now know that this large spike in temperature that we're experiencing right now is due to elevated CO2 emitted from the burning of fossil fuels. There's, it's not controversial. We know uh, that, that that's a fact and that it's been going on since um, the 1800s. And in fact, this um, phenomenon of the greenhouse effect was known by scientists in the 1800s. Now, we've only had uh, direct measurements of temperature in a really consistent way since the 1700s, 1800s. Prior to then, we didn't have instruments to measure temperature. So how did we know what the temperature was all the way back um, to year zero? And we even can reconstruct temperatures even further back to that. Well, a lot of these are temperature prox, a lot of these prior to this dark line, this dark line is direct measurements of temperature with instruments like thermometers. But the periods before that are temperature proxies, primarily ice cores and tree rings. Okay, these ice cores, I'm, I don't have a picture of it, so I'm just going to tell you about it. We can drill into glaciers and extract air from air bubbles trapped in the ice in those glaciers. And deeper we go in the glacier, the further back in time we go. So they can date when a particular air bubble was formed. And by measuring isotopes of different elements in the air, in those air bubbles, they can figure out what the temperature was in the past. We can also use tree rings as proxies for temperature, and that's pretty cool. So let's talk about uh, how that's done. This is a nice diagram. It's from Valerie Truet's uh, tree story showing how cross-dating of tree cores and use of tree rings can allow us to look back into the past to understand weather patterns. This particular graph is talking about wet and dry, so basically precipitation conditions, but we could also basically do the same things in certain locations with temperature. And the way this works is we can develop relationships between the widths of tree rings and weather conditions in a particular location. So obviously when it's wetter, tree rings are wide. When it's drier, tree rings are narrower. Same thing with temperature. Tree rings uh, width varies with temperature as well. And we can develop those relationships using living trees. We can sample lots of living trees and develop these relationships. And then we can go back and sample uh, old tree rings. And so, for instance, we can like go into a forest and find trees that have been dead for a while. Maybe we take a core out of that dead tree and we cross date it. Um, cross dating is basically matching wide patterns of wide rings and narrow rings between different chronologies. So we got a living tree here with narrow rings and wide rings, and we match those up with the narrow rings and wide rings um, from this dead tree. We overlap those chronologies, but because that dead tree was living before this tree, we can go back a little bit more in time. We can basically keep stacking into the back by cross backwards by cross dating and for instance, take timbers from historical buildings or from archeological sites and through cross dating, basically work our way back into the past. We can even, for instance, pull fossil wood up out of um, river, river beds or the bottoms of swamps where they've been preserved and cross date all the way back. So uh, tree ring scientists, gender chronologists have developed tree ring chronologies going back thousands of years using these types of techniques. And that has allowed us to reconstruct um, patterns of temperature and precipitation and some other factors going back thousands of years. Really powerful 
a technique of using trees as uh, an integrator of environmental conditions in their rings uh, to understand what happened in the past. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I really encourage you to read the book Tree Story. Uh, it's a popular press book by Valerie Truet. Uh, Truet is a professor at the Laboratory for Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona, which is the world's leading um, dendrochronology center uh, located in uh, Arizona. So I really encourage you to read that book. So from those types of records, we know that basically we're experiencing warmer temperatures now than we have in thousands of years. Um, there's a lot of other signs that, that it's warming up. Um, these are some graphs that have been posted online a lot uh, this summer. This is uh, right now, this lecture is taking place of, in summer of 2023. This will date this lecture because I'll probably use it for a few years. Um, but what this is showing is uh, temperature data. And these are global temperatures. So these are global averages. Um, Throughout the, throughout the year, so what you can see is that this is summer, this is winter, going back to 1979. Uh, so this is, this is about 40 some years of data. So it's only about four decades of data. Um, and all of these gray lines, each gray line is a year. Um, so you can see there's variation. Uh, and this line here is the average of those 40 years. Well, this dark line right here is 2023. What you can see is that 2023 is shaping up to be the hottest year on this record since uh, 40 or so years. This is similar data. This is maybe even more worrying. This is sea surface temperature, SST equals sea surface temperature and you know as we learned in the lectures on weather um, water temperature has a huge impact on many factors of climate um, and drives climate patterns on the earth um, and the sea is warming up along with the air so you know all of these gray lines show variation in sea surface temperature in this case since 1981 across the globe, here's 2023, shaping up to be the warmest oceans uh, in this data record. So, you know, these are some temperature records that are worth paying attention to. They tell us that uh, we're having directional change in climate that's, that's probably worth paying attention to. Um, some longer term uh, data, these are things that you might you know, have used when, if you were a gardener before you even got to school, uh, these are USDA plant hardiness zones, zone maps. These are based on temperatures in the winter and they tell, uh, tell you uh, where you can plant particular plants. If you go to hardware store and get a packet of seeds, it will tell you what USDA plant hardiness zones you can plant in. Uh, so on the left is the USDA plant hardiness zone map as of 1990, well, USDA had to update their plant hardiness zone maps in 2012 because winters are getting warmer. Um, and that means that plant hardiness zones uh, are changing. And what you can see uh, here is, for instance, a gradual northward movement, for instance, in zone eight. You can see zone eight in, you know, for instance, uh, Oklahoma. And Texas, it's down in Texas here, over here in 2012, zone eight is moving up into Oklahoma. Same things happening, you know, for these other other zones. Here's um, zone uh, that's zone five, you know, is in central Nebraska in 1990, whereas zone five is up into southern South Dakota in 2012. So. Climate change is happening, and uh, in the next part of the lecture, we'll talk about um, what that means, what those effects are, and what we can do about it.